Um, another, the reason I've chosen today to do it is because in two days time, on 22nd of June in England, we, it's called St Albans Day and that celebrates St Alban, who actually was the original national saint of this country till he was superseded by St George. And um, St Alban was a Celt. Um, so the Celts kind of came into this land over many, many centuries. Um, I don't know how long it, it took, maybe a thousand years or more, uh, a gradual coming into this country. And, um, and they spread where they originally spread over, over what's now France, Spain, German, Germanic countries and so on. So, you know, every, the whole population of the world keeps moving, moving around. There's all, always this moving um, from one country to another. And then cultures change as a result of it. But every culture, once, once you're in the land with your culture, the land changes it. The land stamps, stamps us, stamps us with whatever's in the land. So eventually the culture becomes that of the land, whatever name you call it, you know, wherever it's come from. Um, so in France, the Druidic mysteries or Bardic mysteries were a little bit different because it was stamped by the, by, by the Gallic, what was called Gaul, the, the Gallic countryside. Um, but in England, they, it was stamped by by the British, by the whole of the British Isles countryside. And they include what's become known as the Arthurian mysteries. And they were developed by the Brythonic branch, that's the Kimri of the Celtic people in Britain to a very high point. And they had a major influence on early Christianity when the first disciples of Jesus reached the country. So for instance, the great um, Druids actually saw, so it's recorded, actually saw whole crucifixion from afar and the resurrection and the, the amazing things that was, are said to have happened. Uh, the Druids actually saw it and left a record of it. So when the first disciples of Jesus came to Britain, um, they were expected, the Druids were expecting them and greeted them, welcomed them very fully because they said, you know, we've seen a soul who's achieved all that our mysteries mean. They've done the ultimate it's what we're all trying to do but there is someone in your country that um, actually has achieved it so they celebrated that uh, uh, as a great point so so the, or, the whole origins of the bardic mysteries i said they they link with the hibernian mysteries which are very ancient but also with um, the dionysian and christian mysteries as also with the hebraic and the egyptian mysteries um, all these mysteries really tied together the further back you follow it you find that the underlying wisdom is is basically the same but it takes different form according to which country is expressed in and different languages of course and so like all mystery traditions the celtic celtic mysteries or bardic mysteries were unique were unique to the land that shaped its form and the form takes the form of the wisdom that, that is in the land because the wisdom is in nature it's in the land and it waits to be recognized and then released and made known and one of the first ways this is made known made, made known is, is through storytelling and the bards were fam very famous for storytelling but they were telling stories about the land and the wisdom so all these great stories now nowadays called myths they have the land in it. They describe the land and the wisdom in the land and how it shapes people, how, how we are affected by them, um, by what's in the land, the wisdom in the land. We're all affected by it. That's, that's why it's so important to understand that how place affects us. Wherever we are, we are affected and that affects our feelings, our emotions, our desires, our thoughts, and eventually our behavior, our actions. Um, we're affected by the land we're in. So the British, British Isles have a particularly unique role to play on the world stage, as, as every land has its own unique role. Um, so to get to know these roles, you need to get to know the wisdom traditions, you know, the stories, the myths and so on. And like the Dionysian mysteries, 
these these mysteries we're talking about today is uh, well they're key to understanding the english renaissance which, which occurred as indeed to much of what is happening now right now so to, that's important to take on board the land itself has something to say for us right now and it will inspire and help people whenever it can to do better things and um well, let's go back to why, why the British Isles are named the British Isles. Well, it's a name given to this archipelago that consists of two very large, two large islands, one very large and one slightly smaller, of Great Britain and Ireland, as they're nowadays called, and many smaller surrounding islands. And the name itself is derived from the Latinized form of the Greek Britannique, or Britanni, Britannii, which refers to the collection of islands known today as the British Isles. And the inhabitants were named the Britanni or Britanni, or simply Britons. Um, that's, that's a later form of the, of the Greek, Greek word. So the Britons or Britanni were the original British race living in this land. And the name itself, Britanni, um, in Greek and Celtic, means people of the forms. And that's usually taken to mean they were painted folk, figured folk, tattooed. <laughs> in other words, they were famous for their tattoos. But it also has another meaning which comes out in the Hebrew use of the word Briton. And that means the chosen people or covenant people. That, mean, that means the people of the covenant who've made a covenant with God. It comes from the word Brit or Berit, which means covenant, promise, pledge or contract. And the very literal meaning of it, give you an idea of it, means a circle or ring or chain. I like a chain of friendship, you know, or, or a circle of friendship. Um, and and the, the, the oldest symbol for the divine, which is the universe, it is the circle as well. So anyway, it has these two meanings, an outer meaning and an inner meaning. Um, so true, true Britain, which which the Bards, Bartes and Druids were, uh, were those who'd actually made a covenant, made a promise to the divine being, um, which can manifest itself in the spirit of the land, or um, well, the spirit of the world or spirit of the universe. So that, that's what happened first. And um, it's difficult to know exactly when the Brit British race inhabited the whole of the British Isles, but it was a long time before the Gaels actually came. The Gaels um, were the Gaelic-speaking Celts, and they invaded and conquered Ireland. And they came, they came <laughs> from what's now Portugal, the south of Portugal, and moved northwards following a, uh, one of these north lines. Um, so they used to navigate by north lines, east-west lines, and other lines like that. And um, they followed this north line northwards and they invaded and conquered Ireland. So from the south of Portugal, going north, directly north, you get to Ireland. And that's where they went and they took it over. They conquered it and they named the land Airy after their goddess, Airy. Hence Airy land or Ireland, the land of Airy, the goddess. The remaining part of the British Isles that was left now, uh, which is now known as Great Britain, was referred to by the Celts and in classical texts as Albion. Albion. There are different interpretations of that, but one of the interpretations is, is the white land. Um, and we get our word alb from that, which is a white vestment that priests wear. Um, so it's white something or other, <laughs> white being. But it, Really, in its spiritual way, it refers to white light um, and purity and so on. But whether the land really was pure is another matter. Anyway, it's an ideal. And then with the, Ro with the Roman invasion in the first century BC, the Romans referred to Ireland as Hibernia or Scotia. And they referred to Scotland as Caledonia. And the name Britannicae or Britannia was used to refer to the Roman province of Britain, which is now England and Wales. 
<laughs> so you can see how a lot of name changing has happened. And yet we're hanging on to some of the old names. And then when the Northern Irish settled and gradually took over Caledonia, which is now Scotland, from the sixth century onwards, they renamed it first as Alba, referring to the polity of the Picts and Scots united as one kingdom. And then later, when they'd taken the whole thing over completely in the Middle Ages, they renamed it to Scotland, named after Scota, the ancestral mother of the Gaels. And Scoti actually was the Latin name for the Gaels as well. So <laughs> then we go on again. When Britannia, that's the Roman province of Britain, when Britannia was invaded and occupied by the Angles, Saxons and Norse, the land was divided into England and Wales, with England being named after the Anglo-Saxon conqueror occupiers, and the western part of the land, which was unconquered, being termed Wales and Cornwall. Um, and Wales was a proto-Germanic name for the Celtic people. And then in 1066, both England and Wales were invaded and ruled for centuries thereafter by the Normans and their successors until the Tudors, time of the Tudors, who were part Welsh and they came to power as sovereigns. And that was um, in the 16th century. Then in Henry VIII's time, Wales were legally united with England and the whole of Britain was called England. Nowadays we call it England and Wales, but at one time, whole of Roman Britain was called England. Just to confuse you all, but I thought <laughs> names are quite important. <laughs> so I thought I'd go through this for you as carefully as I can. <laughs> So you can see from one point of view, us lot in the British Isles have got a problem. <laughs> We've got many problems. One of them is with names. And people get quite, quite um, serious about names and sometimes a bit angsty. So it's, it's, it's quite a critical thing. Then you've got the added thing that in the early 17th century, King James VI of Scotland became James I of England as well. And the two lands, Scotland and England, were united under one crown and referred to as Great Britain. So Great Britain is not the same as Britain. And neither are the same as the British Isles. So I've tried try to explain this to you. But the British mysteries, which are the Brythonic or Celtic mysteries of these islands, still exist. And they became very important when the Tudors came to the throne. So I want to take you on a journey now to see something of the land, because the land has the wisdom in it. And um, the British Isles is really made up of three definite lands, integrate, integral lands in their own, own right and they express the goddess of the British Isles. The British Isles is very feminine um, in that respect. I mean all land is feminine really um, but the British Isles in respect to other lands is particularly feminine. It's always been known as a feminine land and it has these three main lands and these three main lands the British Isles are nowadays Scotland, Ireland and Britain or England and Wales, which is Britain. And each is an integral whole in its own right, complete with its own national landscape zodiac and culture. So I'm going to say something about the landscape zodiacs. Zodiacs is another word, it's the Greek word for what in the East um, is, is called a chakra. The zodiac is a chakra, um, and there are large ones and small ones. And they manifest in the landscape just as they manifest in the human being. Anyway, there are these three large landscape zodiacs, and together they compose a trinity, a trinity known in myth as the triple goddess. And this trinity was emphasized by the ancient sages and rulers by their choice both of names and of a sacred geomantic royal center for each land, so that each of the three centers are linked geometrically in an almost perfect equilateral triangle. Something I find quite 
amazing. I haven't found it so perfect anywhere else yet. And I'm going to share screen now to try and help you see this. So I hope you can see now the, these three lands of the British Isles expressing what's known in tradition as, as the Triple Goddess. Three aspects of the One Goddess, really, but it's called the Triple Goddess. The three aspects of the One Goddess are, are known as the, the Maiden, the Mother and the Crone, the Wise Woman. And the, the Mother means the Pregnant Mother. Uh, the maiden means someone hasn't got pregnant yet. And, and the crone is someone who's given birth to a child. So maybe still mothering the child, but it's not, not in the womb anymore. And, um, and that's considered to be the very wise, wise one. And here I've named them Scotland's one of these lands, Ireland's another, and Britain's the third. And the, the centres of, of Britain is High Cross. Centre of Ireland is Ushna, and the geomantic centre, not the geographic centre, but the geomantic centre of Scotland in terms of these zodiacs is Dunsinan, which is made famous, of course, by Shakespeare's play Macbeth, where he uses an old Irish legend that tells you about Dunsinan being the royal centre or part of the royal centre of Scotland. Schoon, where the kings of Scotland are, are traditionally married, or were traditionally, sorry, traditionally crowned. Uh, actually, actually the, the marriage and the crowning went together, really, because you, as you crowned, you marry the land, you marry the goddess. And, um, and this took place at Schoon, which is just outside, or not far away from Dunsinan, just a few miles away. Um, but that, that's the reason why Schoon is, is used, because it relates to Dunsin. Um, the actual geographic centre of, our, of, of Scotland is a, a lovely mountain uh, called Shehalian, which is geographically in the centre, some, somewhere there where I'm pointing now. Um, but anyway, we're looking at the geomancy, geomancy of this, and that's what the Celts used very much because there's power in the land and the geomancy is a, a way to get to understand it, a power and a wisdom in the land. So these centers mark the centers of great circles that touched each other and within each of these big circles a national landscape zodiac was laid out in harmony with the land. Um, so the actual the zodiac itself with its ecliptic circle because each zodiac can be related to the sky and the ecliptic circle, the sun's path in, in the sky and so on. And then it, it's, you know, it's said to have then been mirrored on the land, but actually the land has it itself. You know, it's just, we, we project a thought form in the sky, but that's a thought form and it helps us to understand how, how the land is, if you see what I mean, and, and different parts of the land and its functions and so on and how to, how to use it and, and, and be helped by the land itself. Um, so the, the ecliptic circle, if you're showing that, would be smaller than the big circles. And um, I've man managed to research all these three landscape zodiacs and know them pretty clearly now. And I found proper evidence and proof. The Irish one's easy because there's lots of records of that. The British one was slightly more difficult, but I just helped through all the Rec Rosicrucian mysteries and other mysteries and so on. And, um, and also Celts left a lot of uh, name places and signs for it. Um, the Scottish one was much more difficult, took many years to find, but I eventually I found the proof for it of exactly how it is. And um, Iona here marks the star Sirius in the Scottish zodiac, in case you want to know. <laughs> Some of you want to know. And so on. So 
Each of these landscape zodiacs was divided up into fourfold, fivefold, and sixfold divisions. Four, five, and six. Special mathematical numbers. And the same double, because all truth is a double truth. So the same doubled, so it's, the divisions were eightfold, tenfold, and twelvefold. There's the twelvefold division that most people see as, as relate to a zodiac because of, of being told about the signs of the zodiac. The sign of the zodiac is, is the twelvefold division into twelve equal signs or segments. And from time to time, later rulers and sages after the Celts also worked with this geomantic knowledge. And I found evidence for that and um, some used it well and some didn't of course. Um, the Normans used it to invade the land and conquer it very very quickly. There are many stories are associated with such people and the geocosmology of the land. Now moving on, the, the Celts had five levels of society in fact, you can find this in other cultures too. The Indian ones still has it as the caste system that has become completely corrupted and perverted from what it was meant to be. Um, I'll explain the Celtic one um, with another picture here. It was made up of serfs, farmers, equites, who were warriors, and the philid. And they make, make um, like in a, a cycle of time or initiation, they make a sequence like that. The serfs were the lowest of the levels, then came the farmers, then the equites, and then the philid, who were the most respected and so on. The serfs were the plebs. They were classed as non-free landless men. They had to work for the farmers. Farmers were freemen commoners, and they included also tradesmen and some areas of business and so on. That was the farmer state. And above them were the equites. Equites actually means nobility, but the nobility were, you had to be a, a warrior, you had to be a fighter, a bit like politicians nowadays. They're, they're really warriors. Um, they uphold the law, or supposed to uphold the law, and, and make the law and things like that. Um, so the equites were described as the grades of nobility from whom the Council of Elders was chosen. And the Council of Elders then chose the tribal king and the provincial king. And these were called rigs, R-I-G-S, rigs. Was a tribal tribal one and as the provincial one. Um, the provinces, like in Ireland, were, were large sections, you know, like a quarter of the land. But the tribal ones were the smaller areas within each province. Then besides these equites or nobility, there were also the Aestana, which means men of art or men of learning. And these were the poets, physicians, lawyers, craftsmen, and artists. They belong to this caste, warrior caste, but they, their status is beneath the knights, uh, the warriors, beneath the warriors in status. Then you come to the philid. This means the select, the select of the astana, the select of the men of art and men of learning. And this is when we get to the init initiatory stages, the real mysteries. There are three initiatic levels of the philid, the chosen ones. The first level was the bard. And they were the poets, storytellers, historians, genealogists, genealogists, legislators, singers, musicians, healers. The colour given to them once they achieved their bard Bardism was the color blue, so they wore blue blue vestments, and this represented the same as well, it represented faith. What in Christianity is called faith, the color blue. To become a bard, 
involved 19 years of study. Ha, think of that, 19 years in study. And that 19 years, or slightly over 19 years, was chosen because it's a metonic cycle. So in other words, when you start off as a bard, start your learning, the sun and the moon are in a certain um, relationship in the sky. There's another 19 years before they're in the, the same relationship again. So that marks their period of study, 19 years. And then that was followed by two more years of master, where you have to create your masterwork, um, which nowadays would be called a doctorate. And then, then they were barded at 21. And the barding was done in exactly the same way universities still do it, <laughs> with a mortarboard. <laughs> square mortarboard touch touch you on the head the square mortarboard and but then in, in those days which you don't do anymore now um your hair was shaved um in a square tonsure um to show that you'd been barded so that's how you became a bard so this this tradition still exists now in universities of today and it's from from the celtic from the celtic tradition interesting isn't it now, 19 years or 21 years for the whole thing sounds an awful long time, but in fact, um, a bard, a bard, you can start your training as a bard uh, at quite a young age. You just have to show the ability, likely ability for it, and then, then you can start as a child, really. So it didn't mean to say you had to grow, become very, very old before you're a bard. <laughs> you could still be in your 20s and, and be a bard. Um, Saying so sigh a bit of relief there. <laughs> the ne next level after a bard, if if bards wanted to go on further, was that of the ovate or vate. Now these were the philosophers, physicians, prophets, and seers, and their colour was green. In, in Christianity, that their level refers to hope. Hope is to do with thinking and seeing very clearly. So a philosopher is one who thinks about the wisdom and loves that wisdom. Lover of wisdom thinks about it to try to understand it. Physicians, something similar, really. Um, they weren't totally materialistic physicians like we have now, but they were also metaphysical physicians. So they were trained to see auras and chakras and things like that as well. And then they could become prophets and seers as well. Their colour was green, as I said, so they wore green. And there's no given time for how long it would take them to come like that. It's, it's, it's I don't know, there's no record of how long that took. And eventually the third level is that of a druid. The druid had to be a bard and a vati already. You had to have the ability of both those before you become a druid. And druid means servant of truth. And these comprise the judges, the priests, the teachers, and the magi. And their, their colour was white. They would wear white vestments or, or robes, um, what, what was closer they could get to white, but also gold. So they're real, real colour as such, because um, white is all the colours in it. Uh, but their their colour per se is, was red which gold is the metal that stands for red. So over, over their white tunics and so on, they'd wear this special gold thing around their neck or gold on their head, so on like that. So that was their color. And in Christian terms, their, their, their degree of initiation represents charity, what's called charity. Now they, they were experts in mathematics and um, by which you can understand the laws of the universe. And 40 druids made up what they called a chapter. That, that word still used, what well, became used in the monasteries later on of Christianity and still used today. Uh, 40 druids make up a chapter. And in Britain, as distinct from Ireland, in Britain there were 40 chapters and each each chapter was part of a college. Another word for college is university. 
So in other words, there were 40 colleges or universities in Britain. And presiding over each of these were chief druids. So there were 40 chief druids in Britain, each one presiding over a chapter and a college. And each one was considered to be a temple of the mysteries. And then over them were three arch druids. And their seats were at Care Troia, which is London, Care Eroc, which is York, and Care Leon, which is near Newport in Monmouthshire. And then they had a sacred city, sacred city of the Druids, which they called Emrys, which means Ambrosial City. Well, it's a level of consciousness, really. You have to achieve that level of consciousness to even be aware of it. It's like the New Jerusalem that um, is described in John's Revelation in the Bible, the, the New Jerusalem coming down from heaven. This was the, this the city of the higher powers, an etheric city of light, if you like, the ambrosial city, that's Emrys. And, and they're real, they exist. It exists, it's a level of consciousness. Nowadays, the equivalent level of consciousness, I would call Rosicrucian level of consciousness. And the idea of the 40 and, um, and, and the three rulers over it, you st still get that carried on in Freemasonry today with the Royal Arch degree of Freemasonry, where a chapter is made up of 40 companions and there are three uh, principles ruling them and so on. So it's all according to a mathematical law. It creates a certain consciousness. Now, above all these, there was a level called five. Um, e each of the four levels correspond alchemically to earth, water, air, fire, which are these colors I've shown here. And I've chosen Celtic colors. Um, the surf was black, had no color. Farmers, were, uh, the, 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 the um, bards were blue. Bartes, green, and druids, red. It, it's the, I've used them for the elements. So black is earth, blue is water, green is air, red, red is fire. Um, well, there's a quintessence, a fifth level, and this was the kingship, the sovereignship. Um, and these people who elected kings were considered to be um, the incarnation of the divine on earth. In other words, the mortal become immortal, the two, two blended together, the mortal immortal. So that's why there's this difficult thing about, about the divine right of kings and things like that, because this is a very ancient saying. And of course, it, it, that, that's who you would elect, truly in a good society, that's who you'd want as your, your, your great leader, your supreme leader, you'd want a fully illumined, soul basically that's what kings are meant to be but anyway um, in the celtic system these kings or rigs r-i-g-s were elected within each tribal dynasty um, and in the royal bloodline by the council of elders as i said before the provincial provincial kings who are called chiefs tribal kings who are the real rigs and three crowned princes called Cunos, C-U-N-O-S. And the kings were advised by the chief druids and the three princes by the three arch druids. And then there was a high king over them all. And he was called the, Ar the Ard Rig. High, Ard means high, Rig means king, Ard Rig. That was Latinized into Arviragus. That means high king. So you probably come across in your history um, of various Arviragases. Well, it means a high king. It's not the personal name of the person of the person, it's the it's their title. They were considered to be a high king at the time. And then the name of the military leader who, who was appointed when required was that of Pendragon. Pendragon, the head of the dragon. That's the name of the military leader. So, oh, that's, that's to show the Philip Bardvati Druid, and that's the Celtic caste system. Now, the laws were such 
which in India got completely inverted the other way. And to some extent, they've the tendency is to get them inverted even now um, in, in our societies now. But originally it was very beautifully thought out as, as, as the best, best way for it. In other, so the laws were such that the higher the status, the more exacting the standards that were expected in law. So transgressions of a higher caste were liable to heavier penalties than those of a lower caste. In other words, it, is, it was the serf, not the king, who could do no wrong. Important thing. It was the serf, not the king, who could do no wrong. I think how mankind has completely made a travesty of that. Now, the most reprehensible sin of each class was to indulge in the foibles and weaknesses of the class below it. So meanness may be excused in a serf, but is a denial of the farmer's vocation. Fear may be excused in a farmer, but it is the disgrace of a warrior. Jealousy may be excused in a warrior, but can undermine the judge's impartiality. The king must have all the virtues of all the functions without their weaknesses. Wow, think of that. Have we had any kings like that? But that was the ideal. That's what was hoped for. Now the colours, which I love the colours particularly, the colours are actually derived from nature. Because the Celts, Druids and, and so on, they, they were nature lovers. They knew the wisdom was in nature. They love, they love the wisdom. They were philosophers. They love the wisdom. They, and the wisdom's in the land. It's in nature. It's everywhere. It fills the universe. Nature fills the universe. Wisdom fills the universe. So the colours, the colour blue, for instance, is derived from the sky. It's the blue of the sky. And the Celts is represented the, the wisdom, the heavenly wisdom, he wisdom from heaven that comes down to us embodied in the earth. But it's, it drives from heaven because it's spirit. It's, it's the word. The wisdom is the word of God speaking truth. So that's why the bards had to learn to speak the truth. And um, that's what they were trained to do for 19 odd years. Speak the truth, speak the wisdom. Green comes from the, from the earth itself, from the greening of nature and so on, which is full of life. You know, the greening represents vitality and so on. Like, like evergreen um, means sort of never dying. Uh, the green of the earth, which lies under the wisdom. So it un understands, stands under the sky. It's the understanding. That's why we have the word understanding. Understanding is the earth standing under the sky, the wisdom. Um, and this relates to the soul and the intelligence of God and the ability to see the truth and get to understand it and eventually get to know it. And then the red color or gold in terms of metal was represented the colors at sunrise and sunset because this is when the sun was between heaven and earth and it showed the balance and union of heaven and earth together and that represented the, the, the living in truth, doing truth or living in truth, which is what the Druids were expected to do. Um, relating it to Freemasonry and so on, the, the, these three are equated to right hand sun pillar, left hand moon pillar, and then the Druids to the middle pillar itself. And as I said before, they, they also represent the Christianity, Christian degrees of initiation, faith, hope, and charity. Now, one of the famous Druids, of course, is called Merlin. <laughs> Merlin is a name that actually means high Druid. But it's a particularly name reserved for the supreme arch Druid. It could be used by other high Druids, but it's usually reserved for the supreme arch Druid. And Merlin is famous for his emerald stone, also known as a green diamond. 
in which is inscribed the wisdom, rather like Moses's tablet of stone, in which is inscribed the Ten Commandments. Now Merlin's stone is described as an emerald, but Moses's stone is described as a sapphire, particularly a star sapphire. It's a blue stone, but it's a star has a star within it. That's a six-pointed star. Very, they're quite quite rare star sapphires. But that represents the wisdom. The emerald stone. What does it really, really mean? Well, it refers to the what's called the Emerald Isle. Merlin's green stone is the Emerald Isle, which ideally is diamond shaped, right like this, a square shape but called a diamond. It's known as Class Merdin, the enclosure of Merlin. It's also known as the Honey Isle of Belly. This comes from the word bell or bow, which means the word or wisdom of God. You get the same word in, in um, Hebrew as well. And in this land, there are five chief treasures, which are called a stone, a sword, a spear, a shield, and then a chalice. So they represent the four main casts, but also the quintessence in the center. Earth, water, air, fire, quintessence in the center. center. In the Arthurian mysteries, they became known as the Grail Hallows. And note the chalice is in the glen of precious stones. This is the heart center, the quintessence of all the others. And the Arthurian initiation is such is to become a high king. If, if one of the kings or princes wanted to become a high king, they had to go through the Arthurian initiation and draw the sword out of the stone, find Excalibur from, from the lake, um, get the spear of the, the wise women, uh, representing single sight, one-pointed sight, and then win the shield, representing protection, protect the people. You know, all, all kings are sworn to protect their people, and protect their country, protect their people. That's their main big work to do. And then finally you have to find the chalice which means going down 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 into yourself and into the dark chasm of the land and then resurrect out of that it's like a death and, and resurrection and in effect you you yourself become that chalice and you you rise up in, in a resurrection and or illumination it's another name for it shining with light um, now Merlin's teacher was called Blaze. Blaze simply refers to the sun, the light, that blazes, blazes with light. That's Merlin's teacher. So the high druid, chief druid, chief arch druid, is fully illuminated and is because his teacher is the light, the son of God, if you like, in Christian terms, um, the Christ light. That's Blaze, that's Merlin's teacher. And from the word Blaze, we get the word Blazing Star, which is another name for the six-pointed Christ star, also known as the Star of David. And David in the Celtic language means dove. So it's the Star of Dove. Star of Dove is the child of the dove. The dove is a symbol of the Holy, Holy, Holy Spirit or Holy Intelligence. She's the Divine Mother that gives birth to the light, which is symbolized as the star, six-pointed Blazing Star. There we are. And in this, you've got the, buried in this, the geometry that represents the mystical marriage of male and female, the two, two, two polarities that are called male and female, or in, in, in terms of Genesis, it's Abba, Ama, father and mother, which is what Elohim means, and that, that's translated now as God. But uh, in the beginning, Elohim, which means Abba, Ama, father, mother, created everything. And we, as man, man means mind or soul, 
we, we are each male and female, created male and female in the likeness of, of the divine. Only we have to discover that and learn to make friends with these two parts of our built-in natures. Um, and of course, friends and lover, lovers of each other. So, that, so that's the geometry behind this represents all this. So first of all, the two triangles, one pointing down, one pointing up, represents these, these two masculine and feminine, um, which is symbolized um, alchemically and in the Bible as fire and water. So fi the fire water blended together, fire water blended together, mystical marriage makes what's called ether or akasha. Uh, and that means light. They fuse as light because they love each other and they, they express themselves as that love, that perfect love union, which is light, the six pointed star. And then they also represent all the four elements, which are all brought together in one as the quintessence. So the upward pointing triangle represents fire, the downward pointing triangle represents water. Air is the upward pointing triangle with the line across it and the earth, the downward pointing triangle with the line across it there. So that, that's the way these elements are, have been portrayed for millennia. And um, so it gives, gives you the, one of the secrets of this blazing star, the divine wisdom revealed in intelligence. Now going back to the Emerald Isle of Britain itself, it has this zodiac, the British zodiac, and I've shown it here with the 12 equal signs on it. As, as, as I've discovered it and which there are records for, you know, one has to hunt for them. It's not so easy to find as in Ireland, if you hunt for them and so on. And London is, is a key point. So that yellow dot there represents the midwinter sun, solstice sun at now, where it is now in the 26,000 year cycle. And where this yellow dot here, its polarity is, represents the midsummer sun, which is happening right now on the cusp of Gemini and Taurus. And when, when the solstice suns are in, are in this position, it's said that's the start of the new 26,000 year cycle. Um, the Celts knew this. And they made this great center, Care Troia, they called it, seat of Troy, um, that later was called by the Romans Londinium, and now London, um, that, that sits right as that marker of the midwinter sun as it is now. Now this midwinter sun is the closest the sun ever is in the sky to the center of the Milky Way galaxy. So it just represents the heart, heart of the Divine Mother really. And the mid midsummer sun, here on this cusp is by the Orion. Orion was seen as a symbol of the Divine Father and his finger that lays out the universe points to where the midsummer sun is now. That's happening right now. The sun is there, we're in this position now. And funnily enough has been erected there a few years ago, a wonderful sculpture called the Dream, which rises up in the sky like a, a white pillar it shows a, a young woman's face, eyes closed, dreaming a, a wonderful future, rising out of, 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 of um, a coal pit, coal mine, basically. She's coming out of the dark, into the light, dreaming of a golden future. The golden age is going to be born from now onwards. But we've got to um, bring light into all the dark places first. So. Wonderful. Celts knew this, they started to lay it out. Normans knew this when they invaded, so they built the White Tower of London on a particularly important place <laughs> in what's now London. Um, and the centre here is at High Cross. And then the 
along this line, you get the link to Ushna in Ireland, making that axis across there. Anyway, I won't go into it too much detail because that, that would take two or three more talks, really. Um, but the, the, I've shown you the, the, six, the, the 12 signs, if you like, 12 equal sections, because that represents within that geometry, you can, you can make two six-pointed stars, a male and female six-pointed stars. So it contains the blazing star. Now underlying all that is, is you can find the stars of heaven, as it were, imprinted on the earth. And the Celts took this seriously. And they would work out the, the connections between the, the, the sky and the, and the earth. Um, and this to them was combining heaven above with earth below connecting the blue and the green, if you like, of the Bard and the Varte, and making that middle section uh, of paradise. Heaven, and the, heaven on earth is the paradise, true paradise, which they called Avalon. And that is the mystical place. And the surface of the land represents that mystical place where sky and earth meet each other and we walk the land in that mystical place. It's very important to get to understand this. So we are at the meeting places of above and below. Now Avalon, which is the name for this paradise on earth, uh, this heaven on earth, which is a paradise, um, Avalon is famous for its apple orchard, also known as the apple orchard of the Hesperides. And so Merlin, stories about Merlin being seated under an apple tree eating apples. And apples, as you may know, to, to the, um, to, in different parts of the, uh, the, the different parts of the world, um, including to the Hebrews, the apple tree was known as the fruit what was known as the tree of knowledge. So the apple itself is the fruit of the tree of knowledge. So Merlin's seated under an apple tree eating a fruit of knowledge. That's the knowledge of all truth. And that, that means illumination. In fact, if you cut an apple vertically, you get, you get the same geometry as if you've created your celestial form, your light body, where you have wings like wings of an angel. And if you cut an apple, horizontally, then you see it's got like a rose, rose design in, in, the, in its pip, in its centre with, with a pip in each of the petals, as it were. So <laughs> the rose is wonderful mystery secret. Now this round, this was also known as the round table of the Arthurian mysteries. So when, when a king or a high king became a high king, he was taking on the role of Arthur. He was taking on the God role. Arthur in Celt, Celtic means is, is Hugh, the word Hugh or Lou, um, which, which means light or the embodied light. And um, so to become an Arthur or Hugh, you had to marry the right woman because the woman represented the land. So this was a symbol of marrying the land. You had to marry the land. You had to know the land. And, um, and you had to look after it and tend for it. Um, so the, the land itself is, is the round table. And of course he has helpers, which are his knights and ladies um, all helping. So Arthur, in the stories of Arthur, when he, he was a prince, or a king, a rig, R-I-G. He used the red dragon as his emblem. As high king, Ard Rig, or Arviragus, he used the red cross as his emblem. And the red cross is associated with the swan. 
which is a constellation of Cygnus, also known as the Northern Cross in the sky. As I said, Arthur's, Arthur's another, Arthur in Celtic was, was Hugh or Lou, and uh, equates to Apollo of the, of the Greeks. His queen or wife was known as Guinevere, from Celtic Gwen Uvea. Gwen is, means white, Uvea means dragon, the white dragon. Later on, medieval people didn't like the word dragon, so they changed it to lady, the white lady. <laughs> but it means the dragon, and it relates to the dragon energies of the land, also the Kundalini within, within each of us, you know, all, all the energies of the land and, and of your own body and, and inherent nature, there, there symbolizes the dragon. Um, and the dragon is a symbol that in, involves the four elements, um, earth, water, air, fire. So the dragon walks on the earth and lives in a cave, can swim in the water, so it has fish scales, can fly in the air, so it has wings, and it breathes fire. So it's all these four elements, when combined, they become the quintessence. And then there becomes the queen, Guinevere, the white dragon, the pure dragon. And she equates in Greek terms to Athena, Pallas Athena. And so the Knights of the Round Table, they were sent in search of the Holy Grail. And so they searched the Round Table itself of the land. And each, each knight is associated with one of the 12 signs of the zodiac of the land. And each knight has a lady and he has to prove that he can look after the lady and protect her and so on like that. And eventually when he's gone through all the different labors like the Her labors of Hercules, he can come to find the Holy Grail in the very center. Found in the Glen of Precious Stones in the center of the zodiac. Well, you might all want to rush off now to High Cross and see if you can find the Holy Grail. <laughs> but I'll, I'll just give you a hint you've got to perform these 12 labors first. <laughs> so you've got to do the circuit of the land, understand every part of that land first before you can go to the center and have any hope of finding this Holy Grail. Um, Anyway, <laughs> you might do it. <laughs> There's a task for you. Now, Arthur, also called Hugh, was also symbolized as a boar, B-O-A-R, the male swine. And Guinevere, who's also known as the goddess Caridwen, was symbolized as a great white sow that can fly in the air. And so it's said in various stories of the bards that, that she would fly around and wherever, and she'd get pregnant and wherever she dropped a litter of piglets, a mystery school grew up. Just imagine that, <laughs> quite fun. And all, all the druids actually were symbolized as boars and, um, and sows as well, because they're druidesses too. And Merlin, Merlin was known as the swineherd, looked after them all. And this is quite similar to the Dionysian mysteries. And the boar eventually, it's, it's a symbol of, of initiation you have to go through, and eventually you have to just die in an initiatory way, and then you become the swan. So that the high druids, if they underwent this initiation, would become the swan. And that's why they were so excited when they saw this happening in Palestine of Jesus's time and saw somebody actually become what they would call a swan. And, um, and Jesus is symbolized as a swan, the Dionysian mysteries. Well, a lot of this was taken up in the, in the Renaissance time. So I just want to show you this emblem showing the boar and the swine herd um, and the secret sign, the AA sign, the double A sign and 
And this actually represents the ruins of the Temple of Solomon that will be rebuilt uh, by Zerubbabel. And um, so on like that. Now, one of the great myths concerning the land um, is about Bran and Branwyn. Bran, the word Bran means raven. Branwen means the white raven. Bran is known as the god of prophecy, the arts, music, writing, and war, patron of the bards. But, but Bran is the great god who's patron of the bards. And Bran Wen is the raven goddess and is Bran's feminine counterpart, sometimes called his sister. And in the myth, I'm going to tell you, she's equated as being his sister. Now the story concerns, the, the myth or story concerns the marriage of Branwen to an Irish king called Math Mathuluk, Mathuluk, who was king of Ireland, Mathuluk. She married Mathuluk. However, at the wedding feast, which took place in the Snowdonia area, um, an insult was given to the Irish king by Ennisian, a half-brother of Bran and Branwen which was not forgotten by the Irish. And this ultimately led to Branwen being mistreated in Ireland by her husband. When Bran eventually discovered that his sister was being badly treated, he gathered a mighty army from all the provinces of Britain and crossed the Irish sea to rescue his sister. And many great battles ensued. And in the end, there was no winning side, but all the Irish men were slain and only seven British men survived among them being Bran's brother, Manwidin, the Druid Prince Taliesin, and Pradiri, son of Pau, Prince of Dyfed. The Bran had been mortally wounded. He, he was a semi-divine being, but both, divine, uh, both immortal and immortal. But he'd been, his mortal side had been mortally wounded in the foot by a poison spear, but survived long enough he survived long enough to ask his remaining companions to cut off his head when he had breathed his last, and then to carry his head to Care London or London, where they were to bury it in Gw Gwynfrin, the White Hill, facing the continent as a protective talisman against plagues and invasion. Brown also said that on the journey his head would talk, sing, and prophesy to them and be as pleasant company as it was in life. And then when Bran died, all the harvests back in Britain started to fail and the land became barren and unworkable. So carrying the head of Bran, these seven surviving British warriors left Ireland together with Bran's sister, Branwen, leaving behind them five pregnant Irish women by whom the land could be repopulated. And they landed at Talibolium at, in Abba Alor, the mouth of the Alor River on Anglesey, where Branwen, on seeing the coasts of both Ireland and Britain, became so distraught over the death of her brother and the terrible havoc that had been reaped on both nations, for which she felt herself to be responsible, that she died from a broken heart. And having interred Branwen's remains on Anglesey, there's Anglesey there. Having interred her remains on Anglesey in a cairn called Bed Branwen, Manawidin and the other six men travelled on to Harlech, where they stayed for seven years, entertained by Bran's head and the singing birds of Rhiannon, and where they knew nothing but joy and mirth. Um, Harlech is, is not far from Carnarvon there. The head then instructed them to move on to Gwales which means shelter or lair, where there was a fabulous castle in which the companions lived for a further eight years, eight, 80 years. There they were entertained by the head and feasted in blissful forgetfulness, completely unaware of the passing of time. The castle had a hall with three doors, 
Two doors were opened, but the third door facing Cornwall, which is a name for the whole of Britain, an old name for the whole of Britain at one time, uh, the door facing the rest of Britain was kept closed since Brand's head had told them that as long as this third door was kept closed, they could remain in Wales. Eventually, however, Helen, son of Gwyn, opened the third door and the memory of everything that had befallen them returned. So the seven companions then set out straight away for Care London, London, with the head following the San Widdelin, which means Irish way, later corrupted into Watling Street, San Widdelin. So this came down this route here, which I've shown in orange, down to London, and buried the head in the Gwynfryn, Gwyn Fryn, which means the White Hill, as instructed. It's on that White Hill that later um, William the Conqueror built the White Tower of London, just so that he could be in control of everything. Now this, this route, down from Snowdonia to London, um, called the San Widlin, became known as the Way of the Most Holy Head, and it actually marks the spine of the Boar of England. So there's, oh, of Britain. Um, so there's the shape of Wales, like the head of a boar, and the body of the boar and the four legs coming down to Cornwall. And so this sacred root was actually the spine of the boar of Britain, which is another reason why boars were so sacred and a symbol of kingship and druidship um, to, to the British Celts. So that, that's the way of the most holy head to bury the head in this Celtic burial mound. White Mount is a, is a burial mound, big Celtic burial mound. Um, Anglesey is still known actually as, as the head, head of Bran, the Holy Head, still got a name there called the Holy Head, the Head of Bran, it's the home of Bran and his family. There's still, still a family there who claim <laughs> descent from the original brand <laughs> we, well, through the Tudors, you know, it's, um, it's one of these things of kings like to feel they're equated to the to this great god. So Anglesey was said to be the home of Bran and his family. And Gwales itself, the, the secret place, if you like, where the companions were there for 80 years, probably refers to Snowdon, because that's often known as this this um, special castle uh, in the air. Um, and that marks the crown chakra of the boar of Britain. High cross, center of the zodiac, marks the heart, the heart of the boar. And London, or Care London, marks the root chakra. So Bran's head is the idea which acts as an oracle, telling the soul and its body what to do. This idea, like, like we do if you go through the process of life, this idea has to fall to the root chakra, fall to the ground in order to put it into action. And, and it's also said, symbolised by Aries. Um, Aries relates to our head uh, very much in our thinking. So you get the sign of Aries from the nose and the eyebrows. Um, Aries, when we've got a good thought put into action, we need to do it with humility. So we sacrifice the Lamb of God, Aries, and it falls to the ground, and that has the power to raise the Kundalini. So the idea has, has fallen to the ground in order to put it into action. And if the action is truly loving, done in humility and love and so on, as, as a self-sacrifice, um, then it has the power to raise the Kundalini up the spine to the crown which brings illumination or knowledge of truth. And, and of course, that's the goddess herself. The Kundalini is the goddess or feminine aspect of Bran, which is Branwen herself, um, can be found there. She belongs to the land. 
That's just very important because I expect the Celts did many pilgrimages in both directions. Once we've we've made such such a pilgrimage um, both ways as well, and um, it's a very very wonderful and powerful, beautiful thing to do. Um, so I'll tell the story of that another time. But this is one of the greatest mysteries of this land, in the Celtic mysteries. It's in the land and you have to walk the land or move through the land in order to truly experience it in these ways, these deep ways. Now, William the Conqueror had the White Tower of London built on top of the White Hill burial mound because White Hill, White Hill, Ringwind, is a key to the sovereignty of England. So all British sovereigns have to spend the night in prayer and meditation in the chapel in the White Tower in order to be able to be crowned the following day at Westminster Abbey. It still is the rule, although now it's been shortened. They only have to be there for an hour or so. But it used to be they had to spend the whole night in prayer and meditation on this burial mount, really going through their own psychological sacrifice in order to become humble so that the, all kings should be the servants of the people. You know, if you want to be great, you've got to be the least of, of, of everyone. You've got to be the servant of everybody, as it said in traditional law. Um, not many kings actually manage that. But that, that's, that's the true, true initiation. And then you can be, if you can achieve that, you can then be crowned, you're then illuminated and the crown represents your illumination um, that you've achieved. And this represents the immortal mortal, the semi-divine, the king or queen, representing God or goddess incarnate on earth. So it's a mystical initiatory experience. So this is one of the very, very important mystery stories. You have to make your way up to Snowdon first and go through your humility, your sacrifice and come down to London, do a work of service and take Kundalini or goddess in yourself and the land back up to Snowdon again for the full illumination. Now, there's another important story, too, that tells something of the myths and the initiations we have to go through to do all this. And this is the story of Taliesin. Taliesin, if you remember, was one of the companions, seven companions who carried the head down to London. Well, Taliesin, the story of Taliesin starts with God, the goddess Caridwin. Caridwin prepared a cauldron of the water of inspiration and knowledge for Arvagdu to compensate him for his ugliness. Arvagdu, which means black wings, was a son of Caridwin. Caridwin's the same as Guinevere. And the father was Hugh, which is Arthur. So he's a prince, in other words. But there's also another son called Gwian Bark, which means white light. So these two sons, one called Black Wings, the other called White Light, are Vagdu and Gwian Bark. But Caridwin gave extra attention to our Vagdu because of his ugliness. So she's going to make, prepare for him a cauldron of water and of inspiration and knowledge. And Caridwin commanded her other son, Gwian Bark, to tend the cauldron, to watch over it and make sure it didn't get too hot and boil over. <laughs> but as it was brewing, three drops popped out, escaped and fell onto Gwion. It's an accident. But as a result, Gwion jumped up in surprise. But as he did so, he accidentally knocked over the cauldron, spilling all its contents. <laughs> so, of course, he was naturally rather, rather alarmed about this. So, oh God, what have I done? <laughs> um, and then Gwion, fearing Caridwin's wrath, his mother's wrath, ran away, but he was chased by the goddess. So Gwion 
changed into a hare running over the ground as fast as he could, but Caridwen became a greyhound racing after him. And just before he was caught, Gwyn changed, saw a river and changed into a fish, jumped into the river, changed into a fish, swimming in the water. But Caridwen became an otter chasing after him in the water. So Gwyn jumped out of the water into the air and changed into a bird flying high in the air as fast as he could. But Caridwen became an eagle and zooming after him very, very fast. So Gwyn didn't know what to do. So he thought he spied on the ground a mound of wheat grain had just been harvested and threshed. And um, so the pile of the grain. And he thought, oh, I'm going to hide myself there. So he came down and pretended to be a grain so as to hide from the goddess. But Caridwen became a hen and swallowed him up. <laughs> the goddess then became pregnant and gave birth to Gwion in a new form. Now, do you see what we've just gone through? We've gone through a hare, which is the earth element, the, the, the fish, which is the water element, the bird, which is the air element, and then the mound of wheat grain, the fruit of the earth, which is so, so the fire element. So it's the sequence of initiation of the what's called the lesser mysteries. And then you die, Simpl you, you, you die in an initiatory way and you're reborn, reborn from the goddess. So it's why Jesus of course, said, said to his disciples and others that um, to enter the kingdom of heaven, you got to go back into the womb of your mother. He's referring to the divine mother. Um, it's an initiatory death, and then you become reborn as, as, the, as the true true initiate and so on. So the goddess became pregnant and gave birth to Gwion in a new form, and she placed the child in a bag of skin and cast him into the river of life to be found by someone who would adopt and raise him. The bag with the babe in it floated down the river until it reached a weir built by Elfin, son of Gwydno. And this is said in the story, this weir is said in the story to be associated with the bar at Barmouth, which is not far from Harlech. So in other words, we come right up to the crown area of the boar again. There the bag with the babe in it became lodged um, in the weir and was discovered by Elfin in the morning when he came to catch the salmon. And Elfin drew the bag out of the water and discovered the babe, whom he named Taliesin, which means the radiant brow, because of the beautiful light shining from his face. Um, when you reach illumination, you, be you become radiant, you have the radiant from the brow chakra or third eye area. Um, you, you develop this corona of light in a, in a state of illumination. Uh, so you radiant, the radiant brow, Taliesin. So Elfin adopted the child and raised him up. And while still a boy, Taliesin, who had become a reputable poet and singer in his own right, was taken to the palace of the High King, King Arthur or Hugh the Mighty, to listen to the bards and minstrels. The palace is associated with Snowdonia. When he entered the palace, Taliesin's mere presence cast a spell on the assembled company, such that they could make no sound at all. King Arthur asked Taliesin to explain himself, and Taliesin replied with an inspired song of illumination. And Taliesin then grew up and became the chief bard, Varte and Druid, and then High King in his turn. So it's a wonderful story about the initiation of someone associated with the whole landscape of Britain. And the cauldron, the cauldron of Caridwen became the, the, um, the basis of, of later stories that were called the Holy Grail. So the cauldron of Caridwen is the origin of the, the Holy Grail. And it's known, the cauldron was known as the water of inspiration and knowledge. The Holy Grail is known as the same thing, the Holy Grail of inspiration and knowledge. And there's a certain 
science behind this is associated with what are called the nine maidens of Caridwen, nine maidens who serve Caridwen, and their nine breaths. And each year the nine maidens have to look after the cauldron, breathing upon it. Each of the nine maidens has one breath at a certain time of the year, then the next maiden next time of the year and so on. And these breaths are spaced 40 day intervals, 40 days, like the 40 day and 40 nights you get in the Bible, 40 days and 40, 40 nights. So there's nine, nine of these, and nine times 40 gives you 360. The extra five days that are left over to make up the whole year are associated with the midwinter time. And this was the time of the goddess herself. So the whole year represents the nine maidens plus the goddess. Because the goddess, in a sense, is the cauldron itself. But it refers also to initiation. The cauldron has to be stirred and raised nine levels relating to what in the Druid tradition, in, in the Hindu, sorry, relating to in the Hebrew tradition is called the tree of life. So the cauldron starts off down here, the kingdom, that's the goddess. Called number 10, the kingdom is also known as the bride. The bride of the groom, who's the king. The goddess is going to become the queen and the groom's going to become the king. And they have, the, the bride has to rise up whole tree of life to get to the crown to marry her king. It's a very old wisdom story. So the nine maidens, nine breath represent the nine sephiroth or numbers, ciphers, to take the grail from number 10 going up nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, and one. And then the marriage can take place and then the whole cycle begins again and and the illumination is achieved as well for those who are involved in illumination the first breath to give you a clue to this the first breath is on the 2nd of february which is known as candlemas also known as the feast of dedication and that corresponds to number nine on this tree of life the third breath is is very noted in the diary of today and that corresponds to 23rd of April which is St George's Day and that's when we come to number seven on the tree of life uh, symbolized by Venus. So St George and the dragon you, you've really got behind that the, the story of Venus and Mars their, their love relationship that, that gives birth to the child Cupid. Um, or love. The ninth breath itself, last breath is the 19th of December, and then you've reached the crown, and then you've got 20th to the 24th of the goddess days. And she then is preg gets pregnant, of course, straight away, <laughs> and gives birth to the Christ child on the 25th of December, and then the cycle starts all over again. Now, interestingly, uh, Shakespeare took this up, whoever Shakespeare was, and puts it, puts the story into Macbeth. So you get the three witches of Shakespeare's Macbeth dancing together. They all dance together in a circle. And just to quote from the play, they call themselves the Weird Sisters. So they say all together, the Weird Sisters, hand in hand, posters of the sea and land, Thus to go about, about, thrice to thine and thrice to mine and thrice again to make up nine. Peace, the charms wound up. These three witches, of course, represent the three aspects, the goddess, the maiden, mother and crone. And each of those is a, is a triple uh, being in itself. So you get, therefore, you get the nine. Um, the nine maidens of Caridwin um, in that. They're aspects for self. So she, she is developing all these things 
um, threefold unfoldment of the goddess Caridwen. Each witch, you know, has three breaths, and each breath is associated with a circuit around the cauldron, and each circuit takes 40 days. So I just thought you'd like to know something about that. And then to end up, I just want to mention St. George's Day, 23rd of April, celebrate St. George and the dragon. This is the third breath, Sephira number seven. And this is a picture I'm showing you from Spencer's, Edmund Spencer's Fairy Queen. And in the Fairy Queen is the story about St. George rescues princess from a dragon and marries the princess. Um, the St. George story is. And the sphere of light that St. George has transforms the dragon into the virgin soul. The dragon is the Kundalini, of course. It's the spiritual idea descending and raising Kundalini from root chakra up to crown, producing illumination. And the mystical marriage, and that produces the sun of light, the light of self-illumination. St. George is the same, it's a modern term for what was known as King Arthur or Hugh in Celtic. And the dragon is the goddess Caridwen, Guinevere, the white dragon. Um, and the 23rd of April is actually the cusp of Aries and Taurus in the old calendar. And in the body, that cusp corresponds to the nape of the neck, which is associated with what's called the outer major chakra. And that's where the breath of life with the word of God comes in. That's the inspiration. That's the sphere of inspiration comes in at the back of the neck there, associated with the throat and, um, and, and the whole breathing, spiritual breathing that comes down to the heart and so on. So that's why the dragon in all pictures, nearly all pictures is shown as being pierced through the neck first, like in this picture, it's shown him being pierced through the neck because this is the ultra major chakra, very important chakra. And this happens to be made, 23rd of April happens to be made Shakespeare's birth and death day, just to make it clear that Shakespeare is all about these mysteries, about St. George, the spear shaker, same as King Arthur and Guinevere. And Spencer's fairy queen is, the fairy queen is, is actually represents the Queen Elizabeth I herself, she, she acted out this whole role, calling herself the Virgin Queen. Virgin originally meant pure, the white, white dragon, pure queen, um, Guinevere. And so she's called the Fairy Queen and the, her knights are there to serve her and look after her and so on. So the, the story of the Fairy Queen, Spencer's Fairy Queen, tells the stories of several knights, each representing a particular virtue, on their quest for the fairy queen, Gloriana. And it starts with the Red Cross Knight. So it starts off straight away showing you what this is all about. And he's called the Knight of Holiness. So like the, the, the Royal Arch degree in Freemasonry is called the Holy Royal Arch because holiness is taken as being that moment of illumination. And then you go on further in, into the higher degrees. So the Red Cross is the Knight of Holiness and must defeat both theological error and the Dragon of Deception to free the parents of Una, who is truth. And then it, then it goes through the other books and they all have, knights all have given different names. So Queen Elizabeth carried on what her father, Henry VIII, tried to do, and that was to restore the whole symbolism and whole acting out of the Knights of the Round Table. And she managed to do it in full glory, helped by her Rosicrucian fraternity. Um, and the, the great tournaments representing this were held on her a day that celebrated her, uh, her becoming queen of, of England. So these, they were called the Queen's Succession Day tournaments and they were Arthurian tournaments. And this, this is something that the Golden and Rosy Cross Knights, also known as Knights of the Helmet, were the secret fraternity of men and women lying behind all this and trying to make sure the wisdom 
was expressed through them. So I'll end there, but I wanted to give you a link into those times. And then next time we'll go into the Rosicrucian mysteries, which are these bardic mysteries transformed and called the Rosicrucian mysteries.